so that's why you'll see a lot of times um, engineers dealing with trade compliance and maybe they're talking also to HR. I mean, there's so many different areas where technology can touch and uh, a release of technology is an expert. Welcome to Simply Trade, brought to you by Global Training Center. My name is Lalo, and together with my co-host, Andy, we have well over 60 years of combined trade, logistics, and supply chain experience. Along the way, we have seen and witnessed different challenges in trade compliance. We decided to put the show together and call on our friends and colleagues in the business to hang out with us and share their knowledge in all things trade. Thank you for spending some time with us. Enjoy the show. All right, so Michelle, with the pitfalls, and again, I love the concept here, the pitfalls of uh, advanced export uh, compliance, is why don't you just start off with where, uh, in, in general, what you are going to talk to us today about, and before we go too much further, this is like kind of on the side note, but for those when we're talking about, well, it requires a license. What's a license going to do? It, it's, it's, is it more of the extra bureaucracy that would be tied to the commodity that if I have to file for a license, it's going to make my company, it forces us to become more aware of what really we have to do and where that's going and that we're going to control where that uh, product goes? Or is it just a bureaucratic thing for the government to charge me an extra fee? It is, it is definitely not about the fees. License applications, um, generally speaking, do not have fees to the government. You may have one to someone who's preparing the license application for you, but right. you're not going to have a fee that you're paying to the government. What they do is they're going to ask you all about your product, everyone in the chain of command, who's going to control this thing, where's it going to end up, and they want to know that this is safe to ship. So right. the license says either yes we trust you you can ship this or no we um we think this is a terrible idea <laughs> um, okay so yeah it's it's permission right and and like i said it it to go through that process to show the due diligence as appropriate it's something that that company there's going to be some parties in the company that half that will gain firsthand knowledge of that particular product and that transaction and will be held accountable for it. So it's like there, you know, you have a responsibility to make sure that that product goes out and it's licensed. And especially if it comes back in, it's all tied in with the same declaration to the, to uh, the government. So, okay. Yeah. Next point. Yeah, um, oh, so sorry. licensing that that's I'll just throw in that licensing is another area where we see a lot of mistakes uh, there you, not only do you have to use the proper form but this is not like a fourth grade going in filling out a form and you're done uh, there's a form but what you're doing is making an argument to the government that you can export so if you forget any minute detail like maybe you forgot to mention that your product is flammable. I don't know, I'm making this up. But um, it, it needs to be really detailed. And so licenses are another area where we see a lot of pitfalls. Okay, to that extent, I will say before we go on to the next one is, it would be, I think, wise that if you have products in your company that do require licenses, that and there's different types of licenses and, and things of that nature as you're looking at it but i would highly recommend and see if you agree uh that you charge somebody within your organization to become a first-hand top level expert on that a specific license and all the commodities thereof that are tied in around that particular license um would that not be a, a smart move oh yes that would be a great idea, especially if you plan to continue working in the same products in the future or the same types of transactions, you're going to have repeat licenses. And it would be great to have someone who knows what they're doing that you can count on every time to file the correct license application. We've seen okay. instances where some somebody just gets assigned a license application, they write a little letter and they completely forget about the form 
Um, you know, this can happen. There's so many areas where they can make a mistake. So I like the idea of having one designated person or, or more than one. Well, and it, it, it also comes back to there are companies that, especially if they're large ones, that have established a uh, transportation council, a logistics council, something to that effect. To me, this would be an ideal scenario to where the compliance needs to be part of that. So if you're an executive level and you have these organizations under you, purchasing being one or, or sourcing, uh, purchasing, sourcing, I uh, consider the same, it should be participating, but along with the transportation, the logistics as far as warehousing, the compliance and, and all those things. That should be part of that council, and so that when something comes up and says, okay, we're gonna review, we've got a situation here where we've got now product that is coming from Hong Kong. Well, with the scenario between mainland China now and Hong Kong and the scenarios there, there have been regulations that have changed. It's not the Hong Kong of days gone by. So can we still just do what we have always done? Well, the compliance side of things, uh, needs to look at it and go, oh, wait a minute, no, we've got some changes here, and I may not have all the answers right now, but let me take this scenario, don't do anything yet on it, let us have a chance to pull in the trade lawyers if needed or the regulation side of things and, and review that and see if this transaction now has uh, needs to be modified in some way or can we even do it legally. Great point. Right. Yes, um, so yeah, China and Hong Kong are a perfect example because we um, have even run into it, the Commerce Department decisions where if they think something's going into a military end item, they're going to stop it between Hong Kong and China because, as I said earlier, you can't underestimate their intelligence. <laughs> they know what they're looking for. They know when they see certain things. Okay, Hong Kong, China. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like I've always, we've always sold it to Hong Kong and there's never been a problem. Now, yeah. you know, why now? It was like, well, life has changed it for you over there. It's it's a different ballgame. Same thing with, uh, you know, uh, going to, you know, selling to Russia. Russia's now all of a sudden on, you know, some sanction lists and things and things have really dramatically changed. Um, I actually had a client uh, that I've talked with that... Uh, it was a trading company and they had offices in Russia, in China, here in the US and uh, Brazil and different places. And I'm like, boy, howdy, uh, guys, you, you, what are you doing with some of these deals you're making? Um, it's, you know, are, are you selling stuff or moving stuff through these other offices in these, uh, you know, in China and Russia now? Um, Cause it's now you've opened yourself up considerably to end use uh, violations. Yes, absolutely. And and Russia is a, a really tricky area, in my opinion, because you may find that, okay, the person's not listed, or maybe uh, it's not a prohibited product, it's not a prohibited company. How are you gonna get paid for it? The banks are prohibited for the most part. So you could try some kind of circuitous, sneaky route, but I guarantee somebody's tried that before, and um, gonna you're not going to get, get you. that past some past the government. <laughs> that that's what I call a scorpion uh, type tra transaction. You may think you're doing fine, and then that tail comes back and, and nails you. So it's like yeah. yes. So I'm any kind up. of like transshipment or oh, I'm just going to ship it over here first, and then. Don't think that you know, they haven't seen that. Well, and it's like, <laughs> hey, I sold it to somebody in, you know, XYZ company or country, and uh, I didn't know they were going to take it and send it on. Well, you know what? You didn't show due diligence in the way you went about things. All right, so third point. What, what, what's the third pitfall? Okay, third point is technology. Technology is a... I'm going to call it a cesspool for violations. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is something that just makes people shake in their boots because technology is oftentimes intangible. You can't see it. It's hard to understand. And companies are dealing in technology all the time. 
And all you have to do to export it is say, put it in the wrong folder where another country of your employees can access it or send an email. Um, foldering is something that I find fascinating because folks may think they have everything in their folders and then you have restrictions on the folders. Uh, but do you know who's working at every plant? Um, it, it can get really tricky. Also, with technology, the area of encryption frightens a lot of people because encryption has a different part in the regulations. Encryption is not so much asking permission to export, but it's telling the U.S. government what you're exporting. What are you sharing? The government wants to know so that they know what types of encryption is out there. So, so when we're talking encryption, are you talking about sending a computer with an encrypted hard drive, or are you talking about emailing a file or trans, uh, transmitting some kind of a file that's encrypted to a foreign source? I'm talking primarily right? about sharing. Uh, I think your first example is perfect. Somebody maybe travels with a laptop and that laptop has a certain level of encryption embedded in it, then you have just exported that encryption, not just the laptop. Mm -hmm. um, and if the encryption reaches certain levels, it's going to require either a license or a formal classification from the government, or it may just require an annual report. But okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Here, yeah, I'm getting confused here. So we're I'm like, sorry. you may have to draw. You're gonna have to draw me a picture here. Okay, so here, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna hit you a question. Is it the encryption or is it the data? When you're saying the the encryption hits a certain level, I'm thinking that's more of the data in that file that may be involved in, let's say, the. I don't know, the fan, the, the engineering uh, specs on a fan of a jet engine, um, that would be the content and it, that fan in that particular jet engine, let's say it's on a, uh, a, a fighter jet. So if that file is on the lap laptop or whatever, but it, you're saying, and it's, hey, we're going to encrypt it. Encryption is to keep it safe so somebody can't decode it and without the, you know, without the, uh, the source code, not the code, what is the key, all right? But is that what you're talking about? Is that it's the content of the file, not the encryption itself, or is it the encryption itself? I'm, I'm a little confused there. I'll, I'll get even more confusing and say both. Um, okay. So you're worried about the content because that could be controlled technology. And that content, right. that substantive content might require a license or approval for export. There are certain exceptions whereby a company could use, say, a VPN and it, it meets a government standard that they call FIPS 140-2. Mm -hmm. That's considered high enough that it can travel from one company employee to another. But there's a second aspect of this. Encryption itself also has a completely separate part in the regulations. And okay. that's more of a reporting than an asking permission. That's where, let's say I have some really brilliant new source code and I'm gonna share it with a foreign national employee who is a, a programmer who who understands everything about software. I need to know if I can share that encryption technology with that foreign party because for one thing, foreign governments may be trying to take that technology. They may be trying to use it. Also, we may need to hack it. I don't know. But remember the okay, Apple so, thing where um, yes. the, yeah, Apple the, the, the information was on an iPhone and Apple yeah. didn't want to Right. Yeah. They didn't want to. But all right. For those again, it was a, a case where there was a criminal uh, situation where uh, somebody had their iPhone, and 
it was stored on there the way the Apple was it was encrypted in such a way that it was making it extremely difficult to if you will hack the phone to gain the information on hopefully uh, foiling some kind of terrorist plot if I'm not mistaken but the the whole issue was is Apple was not willing to decode the the phone if I'm do I have that oh, one right. right is that what you okay okay yes well I guess normally my memory is as long as a turtle's tail but this time I got that one okay that's a great memory Andy <laughs> <laughs> hey I'm good on this one today <laughs> I've had my medicine okay yeah <laughs> Andy's had his meds <laughs> so okay yeah, so with that I'm sorry with that oh. that example you were talking about so what uh where were we going is that is that type of a is that requiring a license you were saying or something so i guess what i'm saying is with that type of type of encrypt encryption you saw a, a real life case where the u.s government needed to know how to hack those phones and apparently couldn't do it right how, if we are not the country okay. that's the foremost the best in encryption technology and hacking, what are we going to do when someone outsmarts us and they're they've got some plot and it's encrypted? This right. is exactly so, why they need to know what encryption levels are out there and what types of encryption different companies are using. So that type of encryption. So the point being is, in the encryption itself could require the license, and so that it's knowing. So that somebody may deviously uh, try and get their hands on that type of technology of that source code to be able to hack into other files that are using the same encryption. So that's what the intent behind a license of the encryption methodology versus the content of the file. I get that. Okay. Yeah. I can learn. I'm getting there. That's right. Oh, I just learned something. It, Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of the most, if not the most, complex areas of export control that you can get to. Uh, okay. it, it's confusing for a reason. It's not you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> It really, really is difficult. And you have to be able to, in your mind, picture, okay, there's technical data, there's drawings and blueprints, but there's also um, information that the government just needs to know because we need to be out front. And, and we need to okay. be the leaders in that. Okay. Well, all right, good. Now, the scenario that I'm hearing and I, the, what comes to mind, back to what's one of the actions that I had just mentioned was having somebody becoming an expert uh, regarding licensing, well, equally as well, and it could be the same person or, you, you know, again, you diversify this, um, and it may be somebody with more of an IT background, but the uh, encryption methodology, having somebody become a, uh, you know, having a high level of expertise with the different, you know, encryption methodologies your company may be employing, but also joined at the hip is then if you're going to send anybody internationally on a trip, just even a vacation, I would think comes into play if you're taking your laptop with you or if you're taking your uh, files with you whatever the case is or you're selling things that uh, they are joined at the hip with compliance so that hey yeah you're going to be covered not only the content the, the methodology of encryption uh, they do or do not require licensing but you have your own internal experts that should say you know what we need further counsel on this but they, at least they have enough knowledge to point you in the right direction or ask the right questions. Yes, exactly right. You, you've got to have the people who understand the, the technology working together with the people who understand the rules and that information needs to be shared. So that's why you'll see a lot of times um, engineers dealing with trade compliance and maybe they're talking also to HR. I mean, there's so many different areas where technology can touch, and uh, a release of technology is an export. Okay. Well, we need to wrap up. I, I, as always, I could always just talk for so long with you. You are so fantastic. <laughs> I just love it. Thank um, you. But Same. We probably need to do a recap here of uh, what we've learned thus far. So we've talked about with a uh, merger and acquisition situation. 
talked about uh, in, in, in looking at that you have liabilities for the last five years of that uh, company you are acquiring of their uh, export, actually quite frankly their export and import activities, but I mean the export especially. Uh, secondly, look at the agreements, specifically the merger acquisition agreement as well as the sale transactions uh, agreements and any other type of contracts that you have that deal with international entities, correct? Correct. And then thirdly here is in looking at the, the licensing requirements of commodities, of uh, technology, and then encryption methodologies and things of that nature. Have I got it so far? Oh, you've got it. And you can wrap all that up with a nice little bow with a technology control plan and an export manual. Um, ah, there that's we go. where all that will feed into. And you can have your company's rules designed to fit your situation. All right. Well, and so with that, there's a lot of actions that we've talked through, and, and uh, with that, the one thing I guess I will say is that we have, for the audience here, folks, we've just barely really scratched the surface. We've been talking about this a little bit, and it is easy to stay at the 50,000-foot level, maybe come down to 30,000 feet, and you get a little bit more details. But if you're in charge of a company or, or higher up in there or you're in the compliance arena, there's a lot of actions, hopefully, that we've sparked your your knowledge, your, your your mind to think through and say, I gotta gain more knowledge and take a little bit of action. You don't have to, you know, swallow this all at one time. You gotta take steps towards coming up with something. But I love what, Michelle, that uh, coming up with, what'd you call it, a, a technology protection plan? Okay, technology control plan, or TCP. Control plan, okay, okay, mm -hmm. all right. So that's something that uh, on the surface sounds very impressive and I'm sure in doing it and pulling that together is not just something you just sit down and say, oh, let me just write this out a little bit. That's going to take involvement from a lot of different entities of your company. Yes, and it, it will require good communication, um, but having that will go a very long way in protecting the company. If nothing else, having a short technology control plan anything in place is better than having zero effort to control technology. And then your export compliance uh, plan is uh, in, in reviewing things and how are you going to control things and there needs to be probably several sections on that. It's uh, We're not going to solve them all here but I mean including not only your technology piece your sales transactions, but then also the employees who you're doing business with, and are they, you know, a foreign national, or are they a contracted uh, a foreign entity, and those kinds of things. So it's, there's a lot there. So with all of that, we're going to be uh, posting your contact information with our show notes, so that right. somebody can reach out to you and just maybe you can give you a call, just ask a question. You can point them in the right direction, or they may want to engage in, with you. But there's a lot of folks out there that uh, could probably supply a lot of support for companies in a lot of different venues. I'd be happy to help. I um, I get so excited about this topic. You know, if you have a good <laughs> question, I'm all ears. <laughs> there you go. So, thank you. All so, right. so Michelle, we like to wrap up sometimes with, um, like Andy had said earlier, we like to wrap up with. Uh, how would you bundle or wrap all of this up in one minute or less? You know, a good tip. I mean, it sounds like you did it already. You said the TCP and the and the export manual. So how would you summarize that in a minute? Like, what is the hack or the tip or the best practice that you would like to say, you know, just to wrap this whole show up with? I would say the, the tip is be aware. Be aware of the complexity of export controls because it flows into contracts and big deals you're doing. It flows into technology, encryption, and, if, and even a, an employee's laptop. That awareness is what's going to make you ask the right questions. So I would just say be aware that export controls is a minefield. And um, that's something that companies often miss. Right. Excellent. 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 Well, thanks. Excellent. <laughs>
Thank you so much. All right. Much. Michelle, I got to tell you, it's just, we have enjoyed you today. This is, I mean, Thank once you. again, you're so, you're just fantastic. I just love you. You're just oh, great. Oh, me too. I love talking <laughs> to you, Wendy. I could talk to you all day. And now I know Lalo a little better, so I'm going to talk to Lalo yeah. all day. Too. Oh, listen, Lalo has been a godsend in this. It's that he's been so fantastic in pulling everything together and, and trying to organize everything. And, and uh, so I, I get to, to flap my gums there a little bit, and, and uh, we have a good time. So. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank this you. Is, Thank you. an awesome podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest in the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at Global Training Center com or you can dm us on twitter at simply trade pot thank you again for the privilege of your time happy trading simply trade is not a law firm or an advisor the topics and discussions conducted by simply trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice you should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.